Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Song Revolution Podcast. My name is Bryant and I'm the producer of the show and we've got something really special for you today. We've actually gone back into the archives and pulled out our episode with Audrey Assad because here's the thing. You can listen to these episodes one time and maybe get a quarter of the information that's actually there because there's so much gold, there's so much to take away from each interview that we figured we'd put this one back out there. Her interview was amazing. If you know Audrey, if you follow any of her stuff, she has a new album out called Evergreen and she's just doing amazing things in the creative world as well as the uh, the CCM world, also writing some worship songs. So there's a lot going on in Audrey's life right now and uh, we wanted to reshare this episode because we felt like it was amazing. And I know that there are some nuggets in there. If you re-listen, you'll you'll uh, get some fresh inspiration from Audrey today. So be sure to check out our website, NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. You can get all the info there. And you can also check out uh, some of the great resources, NCS Membership, NCS Bootcamp. And you can find all of that right there on the website. Also, the new NCS Songwriters Intensive is coming this summer. Check out the dates and make sure you're in Nashville for that. It's going to be amazing. But without any further ado, here is our archived episode with Audrey Assad. Enjoy, and we'll see you next week. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Song Revolution podcast brought to you by Nashville Christian Songwriters. Nashville Christian Songwriters exist to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. I'm John Chisholm, and this podcast exists to bring you valuable songwriting insights, inspiration, interviews, and just all around good fun with some of the greatest songwriters, producers, arrangers, artists, and creatives, and beyond. You can find out a whole lot more about us at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. John Chisholm for Nashville Christian Songwriters and the Song Revolution Podcast. And we are in a wonderful place today with the amazing, talented, and kind of sneezy Audrey Assad today. Audrey, welcome to the program. Thank you. Chew. Yeah, right. kind of allergy season in Nashville. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, well, a lot of us kind of suffer from that. But don't eat wheat. I think that's like the yeah. the day the, the it deal of the day. Helps me a lot. Yeah, cold it helps me a lot. But yeah, yeah still still have my days, and today's one of those days. And uh, hopefully, this Benadryl kicks in soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if you if you start snoring during the show, yeah, today, we'll know. It we'll know that it kind of works. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm sure that many of our listeners are very familiar with your music and your career, but uh, just amazing, deep, layered, crazy, beautiful music that you Thank do. You. And oh yeah, so I fun. mean, um, been a fan for a long time. And my daughter Allie, she says hi. She's been a fan as well. Oh, that's so sweet. That's awesome. uh, yeah, so just for just a tiny bit of background for those of you who might not be. Um, as familiar, you're going to love Audrey and her music. And uh, her uh, debut album, The House You're Building, released through Sparrow in July of 2010, uh, it really became the Christian album of 2010, which is a big deal, on Amazon.com and the mm-hmm. Christian Breakthrough album of the year on iTunes. And she's worked with uh, and toured with a bunch of great people like Chris Tomlin, 10th Avenue North, Matt Marr, mm-hmm. Jars of Clay, some great people. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you've done a bunch of records since then. I'm, I, we can talk about some of those. Sure. I'd, I'd like to uh, spend a little time just on your background a little bit. You have a very interesting upbringing. And mm-hmm. so maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, kind of how you got into this, a little of your background. Sure. Well, I was raised in New Jersey, and I was part of a... Uh, denomination growing up called Plymouth Brethren, which is relevant because I'll explain why. But um, yeah. <laughs> it uh, it was a very small and kind of reclusive Christian sect. And one of the main sort of disciplines and practices of it was that women could not pray out loud, read scriptures out loud in front of males, sing in front of the church, teach in any way. Um, once your own son was over the age of reason, you were not permitted to usurp authority over him in any kind of scriptural what? setting. And so you couldn't uh, you couldn't be the one to teach Bible lessons at home if you have a 12-year-old son, that kind of thing. It was a very interesting um, background. And so I mention it because I think uh, it's pertinent to how I actually <laughs> ended up being a songwriter. Because I am very opinionated and I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> and I think at some point, you know, music was something that I've always done and I've always been a piano player 
Um, and I sang a lot at home, but I never really had an outlet for that. I didn't write songs because writing songs would be teaching. That was what I was sort of taught. Um, so I didn't get my start as a songwriter till I was 19 years old for that reason. I think I had the songs in there, but I just didn't know what, what I would even do with them. So, uh, my father's Middle Eastern and he's from Damascus, Syria. So I grew up in a multi-ethnic multicultural home with an American mom, Middle Eastern dad. And, uh, we, it's weird because as, 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 um, antithetical to worldliness as our church background was, my father was a little bit of a rebel in that, you know, he worked in New York city, owned his own company, worked with people who weren't Plymouth brethren, which was not typical. Uh, we were sort of encouraged not to do that, to be unequally yoked, extended to more than marriage. So if you had a business partner who wasn't Plymouth Brethren, that was considered being unequally yoked. Um, my dad bucked a lot of those things. And mm. so because of that, he uh, exposed us to a lot of cultures and ideas that I think I wouldn't have had access to had I been someone else's daughter. So I grew up going to New York City many times a week to meet him for dinner with my family and my first job was in New York City when I was homeschooled and I worked part-time in New York. So by the time I graduated high school, homeschool high school, um, we were moving to Florida and I was leaving behind some of these ideas about myself. And when I was 19, I decided I would try my hand at writing music and it was just the most natural thing in the world for me. I didn't know it would be, but it was. And then from there, I've just kind of walked forwards as doors have opened. But you mentioned 10th Avenue North, and I wanted to mention them again because um, at that time when I was 19, that was when I met Mike, who is the lead singer of that band. And we were in a really amazing little musical community together uh, in West Palm Beach for many years. And so he was one of the reasons I came to Nashville because he moved up here and his band got a record deal a couple of years before I did. And he called me and said, you really should come. This is just, you know, I'm, I, it's silly that you're down there and you should come up here and try this out. And so that's how I ended up in Nashville was through members of my community who had already tried it out and kind of paved the way for me a little bit. Um, so that's kind of how I became Mm -hmm. Audrey Sott, singer-songwriter in Nashville, Tennessee. And here we are yeah. with allergies and everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, your first record uh, commercial release was really only seven years ago. Right. And that's not a long time. No. And you've had an interesting career path, kind of walking away a little bit from mm -hmm. some of the industry side. A little bit. I mean, you're really the doing your... The establishment of it. The establishment. You're right, right, right. Yeah. So do you feel like talking a little bit sure. about that? Because you, yeah. know, you are a strongly opinionated person <laughs> who, who with, you know, friend for good reasons. So. Yeah. Um, so I did three records. Well, two records and a live project with Sparrow when I first came here. Um, I was a staff writer for a while first. I signed a record deal, made three projects, and by the uh, middle of the record cycle of my third record with them, I was becoming painfully aware that I didn't like the way we did anything. Um, and I think I realized that in a way too late. I had obviously signed a contract. I didn't know anything when I signed that contract. And I, but I took a vested interest in how it all worked. And so as I became aware of how recouping works and how record budgets work and how the label recoups versus the way that I recoup, and it's just this whole uh, science, you know, in a way that I didn't understand when I got into it. Well, I started to observe some of the methods that were being used, and I felt that they were incredibly, um, what's the word, stone age, you know? And we would create content, spend all these thousands of dollars for exclusive whatever website. And I'd be like, well, let's see how many clicks we're getting from that, you know? And they're like, oh, okay, you know? So we would analyze it. I go, well, I got two clicks to my website from this $5,000 video we made. Do you think that's really worth it? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, we just always have done this. This is what we do. 
And I'm like, that's not good enough, you know? So <laughs> I was sort of like, well, we're wasting money that I'll never make back. Um, so I just started to be a little bit of a squeaky wheel, I guess. And creatively, I was frustrated because I knew that I was capable of more than they were allowing me to do in a practical sense as a producer, in a songwriting sense, as a person who believes in um, breaking the rules once in a while. And I basically asked them, what are we going to do? If we don't change this, I'm just going to stop. Um, and I had an A&R person who believed in me and who was willing to kind of go to bat for me as much as possible. So we tried that, you know, for nine months to find something that would work for both of us. And then at the end of the day, they said, you know what, we're just going to let you go, which was the best thing I could have asked for, but I couldn't ask for it. Um, then they would know that's what I wanted. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. they did give me that. And so then I struck out on my own, um, making d religious music still, but in a very different vein than right. where I had been going. Because what was really happening for me at Sparrow was that I was being pushed into a sort of, well, I just distinctly remember they were like, You're, we think of you as our Christian Ingrid Michelson. And I was like, I that's not, I'm my own person mm. and I want to do pop music and I want to do worship music, but I don't want them to be smushed together like right. this. I always wanted to be Stephen Curtis Chapman, but <laughs> I, I didn't get to do that. Man, <laughs> we, already have, we already have a Christian Stephen Curtis Chapman. Oh, that's, that's right. Shoot. Um, I wasn't secure enough in myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I just left it behind and have been trying ever since to do what I want to do. And I've found that at least in today's landscape, a lot of the things that maybe used to be rules because because they made sense no longer right. do make sense. And people are much more flexible uh, to an artist's, not caprices, but uh, different outlets, you know, than I think maybe they used to be. Right. And I think Spotify and all of those kind of discovery tools have played into that quite a bit in a positive way for me. Um, so. I mean, you really have your own record label now, Fortune of Fall Records. And yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. great record, by Thank the way. Thank you. Love it. So, well, so obviously you're unafraid to carve your own way, you know, to make your own path. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's something that true artists really are all about, you know, not just going along with the status quo just to, kind of fit into a mold so kudos for you Thank you know you. for branching out and doing that which kind of makes me want to ask about the motivations for your art you know to the the kind of things that have driven you into this we've had a little bit of the kind of the the journey into it but, yeah. but can you take us a little bit inside the inner motivations kind of what's driving you with continuing to do religious music and you know that yeah. whole thing uh so religious music is its own animal in that it involves catharsis, but it is not purely for that. It's, I wouldn't call it utilitarian because I think beauty is the most important goal of it, or at least for me, but it has like a pastoral element that makes it hard to, I guess, be as authentically whatever it is you are, you know, because you're not just making it for you. You're making it for people, other people who, um, you know, will find a home in it. So I, I really value it, though. I think uh, my aim is and has been for a while with my devotional stuff, my worship stuff, to be that record for people who don't buy those records. And because I, I am one of those people who has 95% secular, quote unquote, music in my library and 5% not. And those records are ultra special to me because of how rarely I connect with one. And so my goal, I can't be guaranteed that I'm going to achieve this, is to be that record for people like myself. So I feel like I know who I'm talking to. I know who I'm making music for. 
and it's people not just exactly like me, but like me in that way. Um, I also have a very real need for catharsis in art. And what I have decided to do is to take that need and put it into other projects because I don't want to belabor my religious work with all of my <laughs> angst. Even though I try to can to carve out room for that because I think worship music has done a piss poor job of doing that as an industry, which it is an industry, um, but not too much. Not so much that it doesn't leave room for people who aren't wallowing in the depths of despair like I might be. Um, so I try to balance things with, you know, scripture and, you know, tradition and spiritual writings that I'm inspired by with my own human experience. And then over here in my other projects is where I kind of go to <laughs> to wallow. Mm. And uh, it's working for me. I mean, as a person, anyway. I, I really love having these different places to make what I make. But making religious and Christian worship music is important to me because it is a huge part of my story and who I am. Um, and I want to I wanna make those records that I want to get, you know, that I want to buy. So that's kind of why I do what I do there. And how I do it. It's wonderful. A lot of the clients that I work with, uh, aspiring songwriters, is they've had some kind of deep pain in their mm -hmm. lives, you know, whether they were abused or divorced yeah. or something, you know, and, and they feel like if they could just write songs about their pain, you know, the whole cathartic kind I of thing, it. that they're going to connect with people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of dance around this a lot and I talk with them about not just putting a positive spin on things, because I don't believe in that, right? right? Happy, clappy, Jesus-y kind of songs aren't going to make the pain go away, right? right. But to just, uh, without beauty, without some depth, without something to, uh, like, I think you have a song called Lament. Mm -hmm. Did I hear that? Yes. And then, because um, I've been on a crash course on your music the last <laughs> week, it's like, I got to know all this girl's <laughs> But, um there is a place for lament. It's not on the Christian radio, but it's definitely, there's a place in Christian life about that. So so I talk to my clients a lot about redeeming their pain, yeah. whatever that means, because mm -hmm. the world has a lot of pain. So for them just to sing, I was abused, I was abused, I was right. molested as a child, you know, does that really help? Mm -hmm. That was a very bad little fake song <laughs> I just sang. But I talk to them about this. So it, what would you say about the role of maybe pain, angst, catharsis, because yeah. you do such an amazing job of bringing that into some hopefulness, even in the lament. I mean, even in crying out to God. Right. Uh, how, I mean, what would you say about those kinds of things? I mean, I think the there's no rules, but I think the, the guidelines I've picked for myself are different for each of my outlets. With worship music and music for the church, I try to model it after the Psalms, pretty simply. That's where I look and I go. David did say a lot of very despairing things. He also would point to the promises of God um, routinely to remind himself of them in order to contextualize his pain in the greater story of the, of the world that he believed God was telling. Um, so that for me is what constraints I have chosen for my church records because I think it's humanizing and cathartic but mm -hmm. not indulgent or self-indulgent I guess however with like I have a, bra a band called Lev that it is with another guy that you know my bandmate's not a Christian and I am albeit a uh, an uncertain one, uh, but I am one. And we make songs that abide by none of those rules because I think there's a total place for songs that literally, uh, their only goal and function is to validate the experience of your own life and someone else's life, to make somebody feel not alone in what happened. And both of us have, well, I have some pretty serious trauma in my background. And so I've written, I, I think, found a way to write songs about that that aren't despairing, but they are not, they don't pull any punches. Um, 
And I, I think it's important, even if those songs don't make it to albums, I think it's important for people to spend time trying to write them because that can actually be such a mechanism of healing for someone to mm-hmm. just experience their pain in that way through music. So, like I said, I think for worship music, the rules or the guidelines have to be somewhat different if you want it to find a home in a wide way in the church audience. But I just say, like, what would David do? <laughs> That's my rule or my guideline. WWDD. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Cool. You I said, haven't made any bracelets for that. Yeah, yet, no, but. right? <laughs> it could be a merch item for you, I guess. You know, <laughs> yeah. The back of the room sales. Well, you, I think you, you made some amazing points just then, but the whole thing about contextualizing. Yeah. You know, it's so important and, and it's hard for people to contextualize, right. especially painful things, yeah. right? The problem is, in my opinion, actually, is that there's not enough willingness to act, to really go into the darkness and look at it and acknowledge it for what it is in its full scope. So for speaking as someone who has endured abusive situations of various types, I can say on the other side of many years of therapy that it never healed or began to heal until I was willing to do the work of calling it what it was of admitting its full scope, of discovering its full scope. So um, it can seem, I think if you meet someone in a particular place on that journey, it can seem like they're wallowing, but they might just be in the phase of that discovery process, which is an integral piece of the process. You cannot, can't heal from a wound that you don't know is there, you know, and There were lots of things in my past, not that were necessarily repressed. I remembered them on a level, but I didn't fully understand what they had done in my psyche and in my emotions and in my relationships. Mm -hmm. And so all that to say, contextualizing that takes understanding it and then you can contextualize it. Um, But the church is not great overall about maybe teaching a practice of things like that, of self, of introspection and of counseling for most people. I think most people probably need it. Um, Not maybe on the level that I have needed it for the things I've needed it for, but the church does not, it tends to contextualize before it acknowledges, which I think is why people find themselves itching to write those songs so much because they're like, I just want to you know, I don't want to um, ignore this big gaping hole in my heart, mm-hmm. you know. And mm-hmm. so, in my opinion, there's a place for all of that. Uh, and I don't think the church really puts a lot of, carves out a lot of space for it. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Oh, total sense. <clears throat> total sense. You, you said so many rich things. I'm not sure where to, quite where to dive in, but you know, uh, I could have chosen any one of about 100 songs that you've written, but... Uh, oh, My Soul. Mm-hmm. And I would like to just quote some of the lyrics sure. because you're obviously deeply into, and I want to come back to the writers that have influenced you, sure. uh, songwriters as well as authors and mm-hmm. theologians, ancient documents, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you obviously are all about the authenticity, the honesty, <clears throat> that depth. I mean, when you write things like Rivers and Stones and the Trees of the Field, uh, they sing in the night. And a thousand tongues lay deep in your lungs to raise to the sky. Don't lie to yourself, oh my soul, love your God. Deep in your heart, I love this line, I'm going to cry. (laughs) Deep in your heart, you feather and tar your folly and fear. Expose them all for the fools they are, and the world becomes clear. Don't lie to yourself, oh my soul, just love your God. Your worries will never love you, they'll leave you all alone. But your God will not forsake you, O oh my soul, my soul. Mm. Now, that's such a beautiful example to me of someone redeeming. You know, it, it's acknowledging the folly and the fears and mm. all those things, and yet <clears throat> calling yourself, in, to whatever extent you can yeah. in that moment, to, like, okay, mm-hmm. shut up, mm-hmm. worship God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me that song is not meant to downplay pain, but more to... It, like, I, I I always write the songs that I need, and because they do not, uh, because that is not what I am doing. 
not because this is how I always respond to my pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wrote that. I don't even remember why I started writing it, honestly, like what experience or what suffering was there. Um, I just know that, again, I think it's Psalm-like, if I may (laughs) make that comparison. It feels arrogant, but Psalm-like in the sense that it is about reminding yourself about preaching the gospel to yourself and that's what most of my religious work is about um there's a quote that i'm gonna butcher by thomas merton it's at the end of the whole thing he writes um in one of his memoirs in one of his journals but he says and i uh basically he's talking about how when he enters into the pain and the the suffering of his heart deep enough, what he finds there is God sitting among the ruins, preaching the gospel to the poor, which Mm -hmm. is him, you know? And that's kind of where I'm always trying to get. (laughs) And I don't always get there, but that's where I want to be. So, um, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. In the silence of my heart, I hear Mm -hmm. you speak. Is that your... I was just listening in the car on the way over here, and it's like, I love that. That's, again, and it's inspired by, well, a quote from Mother Teresa. She says, in the silence of the heart, God speaks. It's a very simple sentence, but I think it's one of those concepts that I could explore till I'm old and gray, and I wouldn't quite have reached the depths of that. Right? Well, let's talk a little bit about writers that have influenced sure. you. Well, um, I grew up, again, my, my background is so full of quirks because I, I just sit here describing this weird cult-like Christian upbringing. It was very cult-like in many ways. But my mother, who towed the line on most of the traditions of that, was a little bit, again, rebellious in music choice. We were not allowed to listen to most modern things, but we did have this steady rotation in our house of 70s folk music and some 70s rock music, depending. So basically it was James Taylor, Paul Simon, Simon and Garfunkel, John Denver, Carly Simon, and Fleetwood Mac. Nice. And I grew up on almost exclusively the greatest hits of those people, so I apologize to all the purists out there, but that was my mom. She <laughs> she was the best of record buyer. Uh, Billy Joel was a huge one, too, for me. Um, And so those were the musical influences of my childhood. Um, My dad brought in French music, Arabic music, and Jewel, weirdly enough, obsessed with Jewel. So I, again, grew up around um, a very strange little small pool of music, but some really good stuff. Um, And then as I left high school or got later into high school and started buying records for myself, I got very into Sarah McLachlan and I got very into um, some of the more alternative rock stuff of that day. So I didn't grow up listening to Christian music at all, which was weird that I was allowed to listen to what I did. Um, The first Newsboys record I ever borrowed from a friend, my dad said, return that. That's, you know too heavy and uh (laughs) so it was more about the intensity of it but I didn't hear any worship music till I was probably 18 um so it didn't really influence me very much which I actually think is maybe a helpful thing in some Mm. ways for me as an artist um as far as you know literature I'm a I'm an avid reader and have always been and um you know grew up loving Jane Austen I'm, I loved King Arthur. That was something I loved. And um, I now, I'm, you know, read a lot of spiritual writing, but I'm very sort of steeped in Tolstoy and um, Richard Rohr is someone I've read quite a bit of the last few years, Thomas Merton. Um, a lot of the kind of fringe Catholics <laughs> is who I find myself to be influenced by these days. And I say fringe in the sense that the establishment probably looks at them a little bit like uh, side eye. But I find, and Mother Teresa is one of those, I think, in some ways, too, um, because of her many years of right. doubt and spiritual darkness. And I find those people to be incredibly inspiring and hospitable to me from across the I'm years. I'm so you thankful know? we know that about her. I know. You know? It was really great because I, I remember all the, uh, I don't want to use a broad brush, 
a lot of the Catholics who suspected all along she was kind of a heretic <laughs> were like, see, you know, we told you. And a lot of the evangelicals who all along had sort of suspected that were like, see, we told you. And uh, those of us like myself were sort of relieved and yeah. so blessed to know that part of her journey because it incredibly, uh, it, it, it uh, makes you feel so much less alone in the universe. But my favorite author is probably Madeline Lingle. Mm. She is um, Walking on probably water. my favorite. Yeah. Um, I've read, I've read almost everything she's ever written and it's the 10th anniversary of her passing this year. So I'm trying to finish everything she's ever written by the end of this year. Uh, all her memoirs, her poetry and her novels, obviously, but right, right. That's awesome. I, I'm kind of in the, all of the, into all of those writers as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brennan Manning, Frederick Buechner, oh, now and, you know, so those guys. So it's, uh, I think probably one of the main reasons that a lot of writers don't really excel, and I deal with songwriters, you know, mm-hmm. all the time, they're not resourcing themselves. Right. They don't read broadly, you yeah. know, no offense to any of the straight ahead, you know, evangelical writers, because there's a lot of great ones, but they don't tend to go into to some imaginative creative spaces right. and I I can always tell when a writer has not been a reader <clears throat> because it's rehash of yeah. everything that was on Christian radio 10 years ago right and so I'm always encouraging them to read the kind of yeah. people that we're talking about I mean the way that I have always felt since I started writing music I was always a reader but when I started writing songs I started sensing that in part what I was doing when I would read and when I read now is like storing away nuts for the winter and you never know when you will need one of them when you will be in need of inspiration and when one of those things will come to you um like a north star you know and if you're not storing them away on a regular basis it's very difficult to utilize that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I use a lot of, I don't know, I don't, I do like to set people's writing to music as well. I've done that before, but more often what happens is something I read once, a sentence or a paragraph by somebody, uh, presents itself to me in a moment when I don't know what to say. And it reminds me um, of what my heart, how my heart reacted reading it. Mm-hmm. And so I just like to say, you are what you eat, you know. It's true, isn't it? When it comes to reading. It's really true. I have one song that I wrote with my friend David Baroni. It's called Oh Mighty Cross, and it was from an ancient document I found in somebody's newsletter. Grabbed the title, mm-hmm. wrote the song. It's in two hymnals. <laughs> and, you know, and I have another song uh, called Christ Above Me that is uh, mm-hmm. based on the breastplate of St. Patrick. Fourth century one. document, and mm-hmm. it's been used at St. B's forever here in town. And uh, so you know, I... I yeah, I, I know that you love that mm-hmm. as I well. Do. It's the role of historical documents. And yeah. do you feel that's yeah. um, obviously influenced you? Mm-hmm. Um, Ubi Caritas, mm-hmm. you know, beautiful uh, on that record. Um, do you feel like a lot of that has been lost kind of on the evan- evangelical world and the Christian music scene? Yeah. I mean, I think there's an increasingly more open spirit towards that from the evangelical world for sure so so I think that's great Uh, I think even Catholicism has lost touch with it um, in a a musical sense the Anglican church is much more its choral tradition is much better um, in modern day anyway and the the Catholic church has has a lot of nice cheesy 70s hymns in its hymnals (laughs) they're okay Mm. But they're not ancient or inspired by that in any way. I don't know if you ever heard. And I don't, I'm not saying there's no place for them, but you have a whole hymnal full of songs like Lord of the Dance, which is a shaker tune with a weird, right. weird, yeah, it's strange. I mean, you're just, kind of, it's like, this is not the, the, the church, the tradition of the church's music is so broad and so rich. Why would this be the only thing we're using? Um, so modern in a very... <laughs> <laughs> non-artistic way and so I think the church at large in the west has lost touch with its roots in music um the orthodox church not so much the Anglican church has done a pretty good job with its choral tradition but the catholic church even with such a rich history um 
it's interesting. But so I, I do try to write songs that are inspired by those types of texts. And so obviously that influences your word choices, your phrasing, just kind of where you're going even with a hook. Mm-hmm. And you're such a wordsmith. I mean, how do you how do you look at something like that and pick out a hook? Or does it just hit you? And- um, the first example that I can think of is that song Restless that's on my first album, which has been one of my most popular songs to date still. Um I think it's just about simplicity, really, when it comes to hooks. So that that passage in Confessions is incredibly written and poetic and wordy, but he has one sentence that says, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Restless until they rest in you is a simple but poetic phrase, and so I latched onto it as soon as I read it. And wrote the course of that song. Um, it is a challenge to look at some of those texts. I mean, well, and with Ubi Caritas, as you, you mentioned, is a fourth century. Uh, there's like debatable origins as far as when, but a text that is traditionally used um, on Holy Thursday at the washing of the feet and um, loosely translates to where love and charity are, God is there. That's kind of the meat of the text. But that one, I didn't. I went in a more Celtic direction because I didn't see how you could make that into like a song with a chorus. It's more like a an Irish folk tune right. um, with no repeating sections. It just depends on what you're trying to what it's for. If you're trying to write a worship chorus, I think simplicity is probably how you do that. Mm. Um, not like watering it down, but finding something that sounds alliterative but simple um it's a challenge i mean it's different with everything right it depends on what you're trying to do so how do you fashion poetry into lyric uh in the sense of someone else's poetry you mean yeah yeah i mean or yeah well there i have tried different things and some of them have been more successful than others in the sense that you know i have a song on fortunate fall that's called lead kindly light which is a poem by cardinal newman and I mostly didn't change it. I just sort of deleted a few things and moved a few things and made it rhyme in ways that made sense for my melody. I didn't really do much to it. Um, so I rather I sort of set it to music in a way that he is, his meter made that possible, you know. But um, I, wrote, I wrote a song years ago with my friend Seth Jones, who I'm now in this band Lev with, um, that's based on Robert Frost's uh, walking by woods on a stopping by woods on a snowy evening. And I love this song so much. I took so many liberties with the poem. It was probably totally audacious and rude and terrible, but I fell in love with this and sent it to my publisher at the time. And they said, his estate will never approve this. They're very closed fisted about his work anyway. And I had moved lines around and changed a few words. They're like, sorry, this is never happening. So that song will never see the light of day because I took too many liberties. I mean, it just, you know, depending on whose work it is and what it's for, it can be a real challenge to do it justice and to be considerate of it. And so, um, you know, I've done, I've done the gamut of those things, but typically just trying to keep the structure very sort of similar to what it is in the written form. I think a lot of things don't sing as well as they read with poetry. So you do have to figure out how to get around that. But, right. um, like I have a song called death be not proud, which is a John Donne poem. And I couldn't just sing that and get the effect I wanted. So again, I sort of just took lines out of it and put them together. And, right. um, you know, he's long gone, so I can do that without any repercussions in terms of publishing, but I couldn't, it'd be hard to write the kind of song I was trying to write and do it exactly verbatim. Right. Cause it's just, and it's wonderful red. I think we should but, do one with Batter My Heart, Three Person I Pod. I love that song. Let's do I that love one. The song. It's so good. <laughs> oh my yeah. Gosh. It's a good one. Uh, yeah. You guys go look that up if you don't know what it is. <laughs> John Dunn, crazy. Crazy. Yeah, it's, the last line of that, uh, nor chaste, lest thou ravish me, which is oh a really gosh. Song of Solomon type of It line. really is. It's good. I mean, basically rapacious and yeah. just overwhelmed mm-hmm. with passion. Yeah. yeah. That oh reminds gosh. me of that um, Bernini statue of the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Have you seen mm, that? No. She had a vision, a be- like a, a, a beatific vision, a... Um, 
a vision in the spirit at some point in her life of the angel of the Lord plunging a fiery arrow into her heart over and over. Wow. And in the statue Bernini did of that, her toes are, her head is back and her toes are curling. Oh my gosh. It's very, it's in, the, it's in Spain somewhere. Wow. Um, anyway, mm. I wrote, I wrote a, a song for our first love record based on that statue, um, called arrow, which is one of my favorite things I've ever written. But Anyway. Well, maybe you should, you probably know, I'm sure you know Gerard Manley Hopkins. I God's do. grandeur. I had a single on the, ra- my first radio single was based on, um. Relentless? As Kingfisher's no. Catch oh, Fire. Did you, oh, my gosh. Which, um, the chorus, sa- it's called For Love of You, and it says, For Love of You, I'm a Sky on Fire. Uh, but the first line is, you live in a million places, your fingerprints can yes. be seen on a million faces. Um. And it so it's it's a, it's inspired by Christ that in ten thousand places. Yeah. Yes, ten thousand yeah. places or faces. P- places. Places. But, yeah. Uh, it is that is a line I believe from As King Fisher Sketch Fire. Yes. Which is, For Christ plays in ten thousand places and uh, oh gosh I forgot the next line but yeah so I was loosely inspired by that poem. Love that. So you can put that on the radio. You just have to disguise it well <laughs> enough. I guess didn't do very well, of course. Uh, but, well, you know. but it's amazing. Well, um, just as we kind of wrap up, um, do you have any tips? I hate, I hate tips, tricks, and hacks. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Hey, they can be but helpful. They can be helpful, you know, because I just don't think life has... How about hacks. exercises? Okay. Or anything that you think would be helpful yeah, to yeah. our songwriters. I'm all about exercises with songwriting, okay, right. and I still engage in them regularly for myself. So my method has been since the beginning to pick constraints and stick to them for a certain agreed upon amount of time. So the first year that I was writing, I spent 30 days writing one song every day from start to finish, no matter how much I thought it sucked or it was terrible, but I had to finish it. That was the rule. And to me, it was like um, priming a pump of soap, like to get it to start flowing. Uh, I really recommend that for writers of anything. If you're a poet, if you like to write poems, if you like to write short stories, it's like, we'll do that for 30 days straight every day uh, and see what happens at the end. You may keep nothing, but your skills and your ability to listen to yourself will have grown exponentially at the end of that 30 days. So I still undertake things like that regularly. That's one. Um, There was a time where I picked, uh, I'm a piano player, and any piano player knows that the sustain pedal is essential to a good sound. And I, I one time wrote a few songs without it uh, to make me play differently. I, I just think it's a really good thing to say, I'm going to pick a few constraints, whatever they are, I'll decide and try it out. And um, because it makes you, it's like a, it's like a hack for your brain patterns. You, you sort of know where your go-to is where your comfort zone is and um, I never want to get stuck in a rut with my writing and so that's why I pick constraints like that as exercises. So it's like a disruption. Yeah. 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 Sort of disrupt whatever you would naturally do and do it for a while very differently Mm -hmm. and don't let yourself fall back on your your old because you can always do that you know. Right. Um, And maybe and I have written plenty of stuff that I would never use but it's just a good exercise for my for myself so that would be my would be my tip. It's very cool. That's a great tip. You know, it's Thanks. like taking a tool off the table, mm-hmm. right? You know, yeah. Doing something different. Yeah. Speaking of the sustain pedal, uh, my wife and I love to go to the Nashville Jazz Workshop. Oh, okay. And watch uh, B.G. Adair, who at the B.G. Oh, Adair I've Trio. She's 80. Killer, world class, travels Europe. Like, just crazy. She hardly ever uses the sustain. Mm. It's crazy. It's Every impressive now and, when people can do that. I know. I mean, I'm staring at her foot. I'm not even looking at the yeah. her fingers. I'm watching her foot, and every now and then it sneaks up and uh-huh. hits the sustain when she wants it, and that's Amazing. it. Amazing. Yeah, it's a tough thing to do, but... Well, what's next for you, Audrey? Well, um, I'm having a baby in October, so that's going to happen. Thank you. Um, before I have the baby, I am recording a new album, which I don't totally have a grasp on yet. Working title is Evergreen. We'll see. And then um, I'm taking the last quarter of the year off for obvious reasons. Uh, releasing the record hopefully early next year. So that's kind of what's on the horizon right now. And my my band Lev has a bunch of singles that are kind of rolling out right now. So if anybody's interested in that, it's L-E-V-V. 
We have songs that will never be on worship album. Mm. But if that's your thing, if you like EDM music that doesn't suck, <laughs> check us out. <laughs> that's going to be the title of yeah. this podcast. Yeah. EDM that doesn't <laughs> suck. With obvious end. Well, where can uh, our listeners catch up with you and, and uh, find out about love? Yeah. Go deep into your catalog, social, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So I'm really active on Twitter, uh, social media, especially Twitter, but I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all under Audrey Assad. I think Facebook is Audrey Assad Music. Um, my website has a link to my blog, AudreyAssad.com, and music and merch and tour dates and all of that. Um, but if you want to actually interact with me, Twitter is the place. I am there a lot, probably too much. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time today. I know that we could have gone a million different directions. And Thanks for having uh, me. I hope there'll be a next time. And uh, yeah. congratulations on your baby. Thank you. And uh, on your band. Uh, incredibly deep, thoughtful, provocative Thanks. music. You know, one of the things that's happening for me in doing this podcast is we call it Song Revolution because so many people are so down on Christian music, right. you know, for a lot of different reasons. But it's like, You know, I don't think people can say that if they go deep into people such as yourself. I mean, you hear a lot of people disparage pop music, too. There's so much great stuff out there. I know, right? You know what I mean? It's just, you can't look at the radio for the only indication of what something is. Exactly. A genre has to offer. Be resourceful. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. This has been great. This is John Chisholm for the Song Revolution Podcast. You guys, go check out everything Audrey is all about. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for being here today for the Song Revolution podcast from Nashville Christian Songwriters. We exist to empower you and to bring you some of the greatest inspiration, insights, and important people from the Christian music world to help you write your best and to be heard as the songwriter that you were born to be. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us over on Twitter and Instagram, and connect with us through our Facebook group called Successful Christian Songwriters. Until next time, I'm John Chisholm calling you to a song revolution.